because we are now starting. Uh, so everybody, please uh, welcome Gustavo Paiva, is the vice coordinator for uh, the Brazilian IGF, and also Giovanna Fontanelle, which is a project manager at the Wiki Movement Brazil. They're going to be sharing a little bit of their experiences, and we're going to have some time for, for questions afterwards. So, uh, Gustavo, you have the floor. Hello, everyone. So, now that we're starting, uh, let me just set up my little timer. Uh, while that happens, uh, there is a little announcement that is completely unrelated to the program that I think would be important for all of you. Uh, right now, the registration for the European Dialogue on, on Internet Governance is, is open. Uh, it goes, the registration goes until nine, June 9th, and I highly, I highly recommend that you, you apply, that you subscribe, so you can participate on it. Uh, this will be a, a very interesting opportunity, I think, even if it's European, I think we can all fit from a, perhaps a very enriching discussion. If you've never been to an IGF, doubly so. So, great, let's start. Uh, some of you may remember me from the webinar with Olga Cavalli. That was the second one about uh, the history of the internet. So I was the facilitator there. My name is Gustavo. I am, as Juliana said, I'm the v vice coordinator for the IGF this year. Uh, thank you to ISOC for for all that all that they have given us in allowing to make this course. Um, and uh, as a matter of also establishing, establishing who I am, I am also part of the Dynamic Coalition on Schools of Internet Governance. So I am a little bit dedicated to, the, to teaching internet governance as well. So with that said, let's start. Uh, the structure we are having tonight with you is, I will first start talking, it will be informal. I won't have uh, a presentation, I won't have PowerPoint. And I will raise issues. And afterwards, Giovanna, she will offer some of, uh, some of her work, which uh, I know for a fact will bring solutions to many of our issues. So let's start. Uh, I will begin with a little bit of bit of uh, This year, the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, that's we call the CGI, uh, they opened the process so host cities could apply to host the Brazilian IGF. This was the first time we, where they made a process like this. Usually it was decided from a top-down perspective. And what happened is that uh, I, I've been in internet governance for years now since and I gathered some of my, my colleagues here, some of the people who, who had some people and organizations that had an interest in bringing this event here and we had a, a, round, a few rounds of discussions, and we agreed that it would be very enriching for our region. I am from the city of Natal, uh, the state of the Norte, that's in the northeastern region of Brazil. Uh, it is what many people would call one of the poorer regions of Brazil. Uh, and, well, now, think, this is a very interesting case study for all of you who may want to stay in, in governance for a while longer. Um, what we did was we, we made a, a sort of consultation, not a public consultation, but a consultation with lots of people and actors. And we agreed on a few of what could be one of the issues we wanted to bring up during the IGF, the Brazilian IGF. Um, you know, we, we, we won, the, of course, but one of the, some of the issues we picked were that uh, as, a reflect, as a reflection of the poor here, well, a lot of people wanted issues and debates that somehow bring up the issue of economic development with ICT. That was one of the main things. Uh, not all of it, of course. One of the other main things was access to internet. Uh, this region we live in, there is the coast, where there are more cities, have a bit more technological development, and there is the countryside that is more rural, 
uh, it has less economic development. Uh, opportunities for employment are more, are more scarce. Opportunities for high quality education are more rare. So over there in the countryside, access is a much bigger issue. And um, this relates quite strongly, and as many of you may be imagining right now, this relates quite strongly with the issue of COVID-19 and what we are going through today. So right now, uh, right now, the whole world is paralyzed because of the 19. So in the countryside, there are issues of difficulty of access. And here are issues that happen over there. First, financial situation. Um, the financial situation of the countryside as a reflection of the poor economy is an issue. Uh, it, it bars many people from ac accessing the internet, you know, hiring the services of an ISP. Uh, another issue is the entire lack of an ISP, that's an internet service provider. If you can't have, if no, if no ISP serves your region, well, you are out of luck. Uh, another issue is even if there is an ISP and even if you have the resources to pay it, uh, bandwidth can be very limited. So you don't have, and for example, stream a video, you can't do that. And even if you have enough bandwidth, it can also be unstable. So even if you have bursts of connectivity, you cannot reliably stream something. So this is our context. And as you can imagine, those issues, a few months ago, we knew they were important. And we were, they, these were some of the main issues that we were bringing up. Uh, we were planning two workshop proposals about this, about access to internet in rural regions. Uh, but then COVID-19 hit, and suddenly those issues, they were pressing, they were important, but they became urgent because right now uh, education has transitioned into a prefer, if possible at all, into a distance, uh, a distance model, an online education model, because of course, kids, teenagers and adults, they can no longer attend on-site locations for education. Now, I want to go back a few years, five years ago, it was 2015. Uh, the global IGF happened here in Brazil, in this very region. And one of the issues that they brought up was the digital divide. Uh, if you guys read the, the lesson from ISOC for this week, it talks about the digital divide. It brings up a lot the topic of multilingualism. Uh, it is not the only way to, bro to approach this issue. Uh, the way they mainly, they, they mostly tackled it in 2015 was the matter of how to connect the next billion or how to connect connected. Uh, that is what we would call a persistent problem. It is a problem today. It was a problem 10 and 20 years ago and will continue to be a problem for the foreseeable future. future. Uh, it is much like youth engagement. Youth engagement is a persistent problem. It, it was a problem 10 years ago. It will be, it is today, it will be 10 years ago because, at, 10 years in the future, because there is always a new generation of young people coming in. Uh, gen, uh, gender equality is a persistent problem. It was a problem many years ago. It still is. It will continue to be because inequalities, we are always trying to balance per, persistent pre existing inequalities. So, Back in the IGF 2015, uh, I, I met quite a few people, many of them w very young, some, some of them from, uh, from the countryside, from rural regions, some of them from very privileged uh, urban environments. And I, I know we have a very diverse crowd tonight. Uh, I don't know exactly where each and every one of you are from. I know some of you. and but I can make a few, um, a few hypothetical cases. If you are from a smaller, a smaller country or a less economically developed country, then you are probably quite aware of the issue of how difficult it can be to get reliable, high quality internet access. If you are from a, a, larger, a larger city, maybe a metropolitan region, let's say if you are from Sao Paulo, 
Janeiro, Buenos Aires, then you might not have you might not have experienced just how pervasive, how how much of an issue internet access can be. Uh, and this this is a fact for our perspective. Uh, if you if you've never been through this, you you probably don't have a perspective of just how urgent this is. You can think, oh um, yes, some regions of the world they don't have access, and that's just a thing. It's just an abstract thing for you. But what this means is these are people who uh, they don't have access to what will, what many would argue is the main place for democratic debate today. They don't have access to government services online. They don't have access to internet banking. They don't have access to online education, which is the topic we are having tonight. Uh, nowadays, with the COVID crisis, education is an absolutely prioritary, urgent issue for the entire world, mainly so for Latin America and for Brazil too, because we are at the peak of COVID. So now let's return to my local reality, to our case. Uh, we identified which were the, the topics for of community interest. What was our agenda? It was mainly economic development and access and education. This was before COVID. Uh, so we also identified that this particularly affected the youth. Uh, a lot of it was the, around um, generating jobs. And, and also a lot of it was because, you know, uh, as I said, this is, uh, these are many, many of these are rural regions and getting high quality education is an issue over there. So, uh, it, it is tragic in a way that he anticipated that online education would be an issue. Uh, and then we were watching for a virus temper and, you know, but he couldn't do anything because access, uh, it is such a protracted, longish, there's no way to solve quickly. Nowadays, uh, what we're talking about is online education to substitute the, the on-site education. So children that were going to school, teenagers, uh, university students, uh, that now, if they don't have access to online education, their education, is frozen, but uh, I don't know about you, but I was I was enjoying online education since quite a few years ago. I was doing courses for Coursera and edX. Uh, I took a few notes. You can you can do post graduation with uh, if you ever want to take uh, a master's degree in internet governance, you can do it fully online with Diplo Foundation. You can get you can get your major online. Uh, you can make complementary courses to enrich yourself, like in Coursera, in DEDx, and so on. And of course, if you have, if you're a kid, a teenager, and you need help on your on your subjects, you can also get that online. So online education wasn't. It is substituting on-site education isn't everything about it. And that's it. Now, all of this, I was just you know giving a little bit of context. Now, uh, now it gets tricky. We can all agree that, well, online education is great. Uh, some people will give criticisms to it. They'll say that it isn't as productive as on-site education. That is quite possibly correct. Uh, that is quite probably correct. Uh, ideally, we will we go back uh, and very quickly, I hope, to a situation where on-site education is possible. But for now, we have to make do. But there are a few hurdles that everyone is trying to is struggling with. There are human problems. First of all, human problems. What happens when your teacher, your staff, they don't know how to adapt to this new environment? Uh, you can make, you know, you could pre-record everything. You could pre-record the classes, so they're all saved. But you know, again, human issues can happen. Human issues can happen with handling the software. So, you know, that is a problem. Some professors can be very old and may be technologically illiterate. Uh, there are also technical issues. Uh, you know, not everyone has a computer. 
uh, or the recording software or a microphone to do it. So that is also a limiting factor in online education when your teacher doesn't have that. Another issue is lacking software or paying for the software. So, you know, all these Zoom subscriptions, they are, they are cheap. Not every school has a budget for that. Many schools are barely making do with what little they have. And then, crucially, there's the issue of access. Uh, this is this is absolutely fatal. So what happens when you have you have the team, you have the you have the recording so the record hardware when you have the software to transmit, but what happens when your students don't have internet access? And this is a situation that many many schools in Brazil and many students are going through. You can't uh, if not enough of the students have internet access then. It can go on. Their their education is frozen. They are basically in perpetual reset reset until this is over. Uh, now, the access of internet access is it is just fatal when that happens. And by the way, you can't just leave your students behind. You can't just take half of the classroom and leave the rest behind because only half of them have internet access. Now. Uh, that is a very hard to, to surmount issue, but some of the other ones can be surmounted. And maybe this is what uh, I'm guessing what Giovanna will touch upon, because her work with Wikimedia and the Creative Commons and other, and other organizations in this field, what they can do is by offering the course, by, the, by facilitating that courses and knowledge become freely available, they might be intensely reduce, reduce, reducing the hurdles to access it. We will get there eventually. So, but even then, even then when there are courses, open courses, uh, like ISOC's open course, uh, language can be a barrier and also indexation. Well, all of this I've given, I've raised some of the issues. And right now, well, we have 13 minutes still. I want to give you guys a case. This is happening today in Brazil. So, if you want to go to university here in Brazil, you would usually have to go to what we call the NA. That's the Exame Nacional de Ensino Medio. That's the high school national exam. It is a standardized exam, exam which will have students going through more than 100 multiple choice questions and also a little text they have to write. They will be graded on it and then they can apply to university. It happens once every year. What quite often happens is a student will start intensively studying for this for this exam on the first year of high school. So that's first, second, third year of high school. They try the exam. Uh, they might not get into university the first time, especially if they're trying to go for uh, one of the courses which have more people trying to get in. So this may they may need a fourth year, fifth year, and so on. It is very intense. Uh, it is extremely stressful. And there's a thing about how Brazil Brazil's education works. Uh, the best education is private. There are a few, uh, uh, literally a few technical institutes here and there, a few public schools which are excellent, but they are rare. Most Brazilian public schools aren't very good, uh, and you have to pay for the better ones. So what this means is that, uh, what this means is that economical inequality become reproduced in education. So if you if you if, if you come from a low income family, chances are you won't have the high quality education that someone who comes from a very high income family would have. And now this issue we are facing today with COVID and online education is that pre existing inequalities are reprodu reproduced in the system. What this means is, if you come from a low-income family, you are going to a public school. You might not have internet access. If you do have internet access, you might not have a computer or just a smartphone. A smartphone, And even if you do have a smartphone, it might not be yours. It might be from your family and you have to share it. So chances are your access to education has been maybe completely reduced to zero 
if you come from a low-income family or if you study in a low-income school. These free existing inequalities are being reproduced, and if you are familiar with feminist discourse, uh, you may all you may you may find that this is eerily similar to what happens. Those that is free existing inequalities are reproduced again and again and again and again, all the way down. Uh, that is an issue. Now, what is happening in Brazil here today is that, uh, well, they decided to postpone the national exam. But is that really a solution? Because right now there are there are thousands, maybe millions of young adults who do, who, are, who aren't having access to education right now, and this is a competitive process. So while they don't have access. There are people from higher income households or very expensive private schools who are having that kind of education. Again, uh, pre-existing pre -existing patterns of oppression are being reproduced. The second, okay, yeah, I thought it had, I thought there was an issue here, if there wasn't. So pre-existing patterns of oppression, some would call, or economic inequalities they are being reproduced. Now, uh, some of you who come from more privileged households, from more uh, well-off families, you may not understand the full extent of this. What this means is that I, I will actually, I will give you guys a real life example. So I have this friend, he lives in Argentina. Uh, he lives in one of the provincias, some would call. Those are the regions well outside Buenos Aires. And uh, some of you may know that most of Argentina's economy is in Buenos Aires. Uh, there are regions, and this is the case for my friend. Uh, he is, I think, 22 years old. Uh, he never had a chance to have higher learning. Uh, his education in school was very preca precarious. And uh, speaking as someone I have taught in public schools quite a few times um, as a volunteer, when he tells me his story, I can just see, I can see that he was a very creative student who completely, all the way through his education, he lacked professors and who would support him in his endeavors. His dream was being a writer. Well, he didn't get to go to university. Uh, there is no university where he lives. His family doesn't have the income for, to sustain him while he goes out and studies. Uh, he never had a chance. Uh, but then this year, uh, I, I poked him. I was, I was bothering him. Hey, you know, you could, there are creative courses. There are creative writing courses you can do. And he, but then, well, he doesn't have the money. The, those can be very expensive. But with the wonders, the magical wonders of online education, he learned that, well, maybe I can do it. Uh, he didn't have the money. But with the magical wonders of financial aid, he managed to get himself a scholarship. So now, right now, he is studying creative, creative writing um, while he is locked down back in Argentina. So, well, that is a very, very, I, I would hope, um, hopefully a beautiful example of what this can do. Uh, but again, this is all very complicated. You know, there are so many people nowadays like him who live in, in areas, in regions where they don't have access to uh, sufficient, literally sufficient education. And there are so many areas in the world nowadays that do not have sufficient economic opportunities. Uh, the internet does bring a lot of possibilities for these people, and online education does bring a lot too. But again, it can also repeat patterns of inequality. And nowadays, well, well, we, we are really relying on online education, but oh well, not everyone gets that internet access, do they? Another final factor, we still have six minutes. Another final, final factor, and this may be very useful to all of you right now because you're young, uh, is that of the psychological effect. Um, you know, we are in one of somewhat would are in what some would call one of the biggest crises of the last century. And even if you do have the time, even if you're locked inside your, your home, 
uh, you might not have the psychological energy, the psychological situation to keep chaining together online courses. You know, we have the time, but do we have the energy? That is also an issue. So that is, I raised a lot of issues tonight, a lot of them. And oh, I would hope that Giovanna can give a few solutions. Uh, what I would imagine, uh, I'm just imagining, is that quite a lot of these issues can be uh, greatly reduced by what? By open knowledge, by literally open knowledge. Uh, right now, Creative Commons is doing a lot of stuff with trying to get trying to get knowledge about COVID into open life into Creative Commons license for the public. And I think right now that if we had more more multilingual resources, e multi multilingual resources, courses and so on, then a lot of the issues we're having today with human resources, professors, teachers who, can, who don't know how to adapt, they would be greatly lessened. So I still have four minutes. That's what I have to say. So if Giovanna wants to start now, that would be the. Thank you very much, Gustavo. I'm just uh, gonna allow for for questions now in case there is somebody that wants to ask me something. Uh, mm -hmm. At the present moment, uh, if not, we move on to Giovanna's presentation, and then we're gonna have a second moment for for questions afterwards. So is there anyone that, that wishes to ask Gustavo any questions right now? If uh, I see somebody. Oh, Eduardo. It is yeah. a very good, very good question, Eduardo. Excellent one. So her question is, how can we encourage, encourage ISPs to arrive in rural regions? There are many ways. Uh, and there are solutions which don't really rely on ISPs. One of those solutions is what ISOC calls community networks. Uh, it is a community who pitches in together to try and get the resources to connect themselves. That is a way. In this case, you don't rely too, too strongly on ISPs. Now, uh, that is one of the solutions. Another one, this is going back to ISPs, is that uh, there is a thing that people need, you all need to understand this about ISPs, is that there are the big ones. So like, let's say, uh, Every country has their big ISP. So here in Brazil, there would be Claro, Oi. Uh, those are phone companies. And but those phone companies and those big ISPs, they usually don't find it economic economically viable to go to very far off places. It, it or maybe it, it might be viable, but it isn't as profitable. So they just write it off as I want water. What happens a lot here, and this is a strategy that many places do. Is that uh, for rural regions, for for the unconnected, the best strategy is fostering and supporting small internet service providers. So these are smaller companies uh, who they make a business model out of. Their, this is where we live. I come from city um, from Bob Town, and uh, there is no decent internet access here. So I will make my own little company about offering internet access in this very small town. And they can partner up with bigger ISPs to get to get the town connected, to get the town connected, and then they do the last mile. So last mile is when you know. Imagine that there is 100 kilometers be between a connected town and an unconnected one. So a big ISP or someone else connects uh, does connects the 100 kilometers. And then a smaller ISP does the last mile, which is connected to the home, and they manage that. That is also a way. Another one, and this is this is one we, if the Brazilian IGF happens, we will talk a lot about this. But there are also public public private partnerships. So the government can partner up with private institutions to make a bigger project uh, that can benefit a number of towns. Uh, in Brazil's case. The academic sector is also intensely connected, intensely tied to this. We have the National Research Network, the NNP, and they 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 were doing at least in this state. They had this very big project uh, to bring internet to rural regions and mainly government government buildings. So there are many ways to do it. Uh, not all of them rely on ISPs. Those you can do without them in a few ways. Um, and you can learn about more about this with ISOC. They are very good with this. 
but there, there, are, there are a number of ways to incentivize things, yeah. And uh, do you have any thought about the country digital excellence? Okay, if it is still possible to make a question, I would like to ask Gustavo if he has any thought about the country digital acceleration pro program. I, I don't have. I am actually a, quite a bit uninformed about the issue. If you can send me a link, uh, I can take a look here. Uh, my time is over. Sorry, I can take a look, and if we have time later, later tonight, I can give send you my thoughts, Nathan. Oh, and I think it's Nathan I met from Rio de Janeiro. So hey, uh, okay. So Juliana, my time is over. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for the questions uh, and also for for your replies. Uh, I'm gonna give the floor to Giovanna now. Uh, Giovanna, uh, are you? Do you want to share your screen? Hello, everyone. Uh, good night. Yes, I want to share my, my, share my screen. So we'll do it now. And I hope that you all can see it. Yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone who invited me tonight to participate in this seminar and this lecture. Also to say that Gustavo's uh, talk was very enlightening and uh, I hope, as he said, to actually uh, talk about a little bit of like uh, things that we can do to actually uh, solve some problems that he mentioned. I can give you a hint that we can't actually solve everything because obviously the, uh, well, the Wikimedia platforms are very uh, dependent on internet obviously so uh, that's a problem that we can actually um, help right now because actually people need to get internet access to access the, the information that we can uh, make available basically but at the same time we uh, we usually think about some things that are more like i, I believe this the second step which is like okay people have internet access they have a computer or a, or a cell phone but at the same time they need uh, access to open knowledge to open platforms to actually study so this is more like it like what, what we can do to actually help in this way so uh, i'm gonna start now well this lecture is uh, i call it wikimedia platform education programs the brazilian case and i'm giovanna fontanelle I am a journalist, a historian, an educator as well. Uh, I'm not actually uh, acting as ed an education educator right now because, uh, well, you know, work, life gets you to other ways. And, um, and right now I'm a project manager at Wiki Movement Brazil, which is the only affiliated group from the Wikimedia Foundation in Brazil. And uh, if you would like to talk to me afterwards, Here's my email. I'm also an uh, open knowledge advocate and activist. So I, I'm also a member of the Creative Commons Brazil and the global, uh, also the global group. And uh, I actually do a lot of work with uh, gender and diversity on the Wikimedia platforms as well. So the presentation tonight, I will address uh, five topics. Uh, we made a platform, educational Brazilian overview, interesting cases, new technologies, and benefits of engaging in the education program. So uh, these are all the uh, Wikimedia platforms. I would like to actually first start with a kind of overview about the, the idea of open knowledge and Wikipedia because sometimes it's not really that obvious. I mean, uh, um, everyone uses wikipedia i know that in brazil we have this kind of uh, logic this way of thinking that we actually learn while we are in school that we can use wikipedia we can uh, research wikipedia, wikipedia because the knowledge there is not uh, trustful or trustworthy or you know uh, you can trust the knowledge there but at, at, at the same time i'm trying to argue here that you actually can use the wikimedia platform for knowledge and for education, and uh, let's see. So, <clears throat> the Wikimedia platforms, and I'm uh, actually, I'm gonna talk first more about Wikipedia. In the fifth most 
access site in the world. This actually, uh, it's kind of a position that can vary basically on your country uh, on, or, or, or the platform or the site there is, that, that does this kind of uh, counting, but it, it usually stays between the fifth and the tenth uh, most access site on your country. Or, and uh, there is an average of four minutes per page when someone is reading Wikipedia. This is actually a very uh, big number if you think about it, because you know at the time we are like in this digital era where we are uh, using uh, social media a lot, and uh, sometimes we only read like the first line or like the title, and you know, just don't read the entire thing, the entire text. And uh, actually, when people go to Wikipedia, they usually go looking for a uh, uh, more profound kind of knowledge about that subject. So they stay stay there for more minutes, and on on average, that is four minutes. Right now, we have more than uh, 2,080 language available, and uh, specifically on Wikipedia in Portuguese, we have one million more than one million articles. We are uh, like one of the biggest Wikipedia's around. Obviously, the English Wikipedia is uh, very large, but the largest one. We have the Spanish Wikipedia and the, the, the German one. They're very big as well. But in, in Portuguese, which is the one that I am more close to, so I will be addressing uh, the Wikipedia in Portuguese and Portuguese here. But I, I imagine that um, all the examples that I use here, they are kind of a reality in uh, places like Latin America, the other countries of Latin America, and also sometimes a reality in also in the United States and Europe as well. But in the Portuguese Wikipedia, we have more than one million articles and more than than five thousand active users. And uh, Wikipedia has three fundamental principles, which are uh, Wikipedia is collaborative, open, and it's encyclopedic. And that's very, very, very important for the moment we are right now, considering the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, because <clears throat> uh, as Gustavo was saying, it's very important that people actually have, have the opportunity to have a uh, open place, a uh, free place that they can access and education information. There is also the five pillars of Wikipedia, which is that all the articles should be impartial, they should be free, and uh, they are built, uh, as I said, they are co collaborative building. They have to pass for some with some standards, uh, but at the same time, with those standards, those norms, there is no fixed rule because everything in, the, in Wikipedia and the Wikimedia platforms, they are decided collectively. So everyone decides uh, what will what will be the norms, the rules, the standards together. So if they think about it and decided that uh, an old rule is not more is not uh, good anymore, we can just change it as a community. So this is very important because not only um, it's a platform that gives access open and free to everyone, but it's also a kind of platform that makes people more uh, active on the knowledge that everyone has access to. As I said, uh, the Wikimedia platforms are open and they are free software as well. And every, anyone can edit, anyone can develop technologies. It's multilingual, which is very important as well because it has the, the, the possibility of reproduction in several languages. And then I mentioned there on the slides Wikidata, which is this platform, very like I really like that platform, even, even though it's not that people don't know that platform as much as Wikipedia, but it's a sister project. It's a da database basically, and uh, the database that when you access that database or in that, in that entry in that database, that uh, that entry can automatically be translated to all the languages available on the Wikipedia. Uh, the Wikimedia platforms are also non-profit. Um, they are not for, uh, it's not, uh, when people do projects on Wikipedia, they are not thinking about their profit as, as a person or as an organization per se. The Wikimedia Foundation is not uh, uh, an enterprise looking for profit. So the goal of Wikipedia and the Wikimedia platform is only the sum of them give access to that sum of all knowledge. And also uh, anyone can use, and that means that uh, single users can 
can can use it, organizations can use it, and enterprise, enterprises can use it. And so, uh, even though it's free and it's open, uh, that doesn't mean that it, we it's not good to use Wikipedia and Wikimedia platforms as something on your like on your enterprise. For example, Google is uh, is an enterprise and they are thinking about profit, but they can use Wikipedia as well. When we say open and we say free, the enterprises, the private enterprises are also uh, in that. So actually this is very important as well because uh, for educational purpose, because uh, when we, we search a subject on search engine, usually the first uh, re re result is the uh, Wikipedia link. So that's very important because, uh, okay, Google and other uh, engine, uh, search engines, they actually prefer to, to leave Wikipedia and Wikipedia site links first because they know it's an encyclopedic link and uh, it's a link for knowledge, the link that is not trying to sell anything for anyone, it's just like information and metadata. Data. And so they prefer to leave it in the first place. And this obviously has uh, educational purpose. And also, uh, I like to talk about this because usually here in Brazil, as I said, people think, uh, usually think that uh, Wikipedia is not a good place for students to uh, look for. Um, and we tend to, something that we say is that uh, the articles on Wikipedia, they are as good as the reference they use on it. So in Wikipedia, as any other, I don't, wouldn't say any other, but Wikipedia is kind of like a reflection of the society that we live in. So the information available on Wikipedia will be as good as the information on society as a whole. So if there is an article that is not good, it's probably because there are not a lot of reference about that subject. It's not because the, the uh, contents there is not good. Uh, because one, we have to follow the style rule. We have to follow this ver ver verifiability rule that all everything there should be uh, referenced and should be um, that 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 those reference should be secondary sources. What what is secondary sources? Journalists, uh, texts, uh, re um, research, uh, academic research, and uh, not uh, what what we we would not consider it a, a good source would be like a site that is like let's say we are writing a page about a painter that is still alive and he has a website for his work that would be a, a primary source so that would be not an ideal kind of source because uh, it's not um, it's the the artist talking about himself so we prefer secondary sources and the Wikipedia it becomes a, a, a third kind of source, right? And it's also very important that everything that is written in there is it's, uh, it's like a common ground. So it's not a space for personal opinions. So this is kind of the overview of the Wikipedia and the Wikimedia platforms. And uh, between all those platforms, there are three that, is, that are very important for educational purpose. I mean, all of them are, but I, I believe that those three are the most, the most educational ones. We have the Wikiversity, in Portuguese it's Wikiversidade. We have Wikipedia and we have the Outreach Dashboard. Wikipedia and Wikiversity, they, they kind of talk a little bit between them because like uh, Wikiversity, it started as like this uh, platform for educators to use because they were using sub on Wikipedia to create their courses, online courses, so they just like move everything to Wikiversity, but you can also use Wikipedia as a like place for, for your course if you are an educator. Uh, for example, I have here, I'm going to show this link here, for example, this is a page on Wikipedia where you have some, not all, those, the, all of the, not some, but not all of the courses that are being held um, online. You see that here it's only 2019, the, the 2020 courses are on the Wikiversity site. But you can also do here if you want to. So you have like all of the courses. This is the yeah, University of São Paulo, uh, University of Santa Catarina, <clears throat> and like different kind of topics. You can also. I'm not gonna go further in this, but you can. Do it. This 
is uh, an example of a course in, that is available on Wikipedia. It's a history course, a history project on uh, history theory. And there is also this uh, political science uh, course, which is available on Wikiversity. So just so you guys can like, have an over, over, overview of those two platforms. And these outreach uh, dashboards kind of place that uh, teachers and educators can actually organize their activities and keep in like the numbers and the quality of the, the edits that their students are making are making on the on those two other platforms. And I'm going to go a little bit further into that in a while, in a few minutes. So the educational Brazilian overview is the second part of my presentation here. Uh, first, there's this. Uh, oh, uh, this is a code that is available on the, the Wiki Education uh, platform. This is not only me saying or the Wiki Movement version, but the, the educational uh, platform of Wikipedia and all of those people involved in it. We believe Wikipedia and its sister projects belong in education. When students of all ages contribute to Wikimedia projects as part of their learning, they gain significant, significant for, uh, 21st century skills by fostering a relationship between education and the Wikimedia movement. We have the best chance to realize our goal that the sum of all knowledge will be accessible to everyone in the world for free. Uh, the education programs right now, they are, as I said on the website, that's the way that the education programs define their, they, themselves. So, <clears throat> Where they have been is to get college professors to learn how to edit uh, Wikipedia and then assign students to edit Wikipedia as part of their course. They have been there and they still are there. That's the, like the biggest part of our job as uh, educators on Wikipedia. Where they are is more diverse with programs in all parts of the world at every educational level and using every media project. This is actually a uh, Kind of the reality of the richer countries, not as much in the developing world. And I would, uh, I mean, Brazil is also not uh, not in there uh, yet. So we are trying, <laughs> but it's complicated uh, considering the social uh, the, the social structure and the, the problems in Brazil. Uh, but where they want to go is to focus our or their efforts on the knowledge and communities that have been left out by structures of power and privilege. So uh, we are kind of in the middle of that. And their goal is to engage new people in the movement and more open knowledge in all forms. And now focusing on the Brazilian case, we have uh, been doing activities since 2000 and uh, 2011, Wikipedia uh, exists uh, since 2001, but uh, the educational programs in Brazil, at least, started on 2011. There is a only collaboration network with uh, educators, institutions, and uh, the most important, online Wiki investors, which are uh, people, users that are uh, ready to help the professors and educators that need help and also the students that are trying to access and they need the help to access that information. There is also information brochure on how to use those platforms. Uh, and I'm going to show the brochures a little bit in a while. So the we collaboration network and kind of involves three kind of pillars. As I said, the uh, ambassadors, which uh, who are the, the users on Wikipedia, also, the educators and the professors and the teachers that are like, they usually is the teachers and the educators that actually uh, go looking for other ways of teaching. So they kind of like get in touch with Wikipedia and they start their projects and then we as investors help them. But there is also the institution involved because you actually need people and students to be uh, uh, on those institutions to actually do that course in a more official way, even though the course is available online for free. Those are the brochures that we have in Portuguese. Uh, I'm going to translate the, the title. Uh, so Wikipedia from A to Z, Wikimedia in the Classroom, 
um, basic for principle for professors how to use Wikipedia as a, uh, a tool or in the classroom, basically, educational tool. Uh, uh, case study uh, how professors are teaching with Wikipedia and uh, <clears throat> grading the quality of articles on Wikipedia. Um, continuing in the Brazilian case, from 2011 to 2020, we have uh, 18 institutions involved. We have 24 study groups. We have 42 professors plus more four monitors, which are like uh, people that usually are connected or students are on that institution that the, 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 those in, uh, educators uh, teach and they actually help the professors. We have uh, 61 ambassadors, those are, as I said, weak uh, users, and uh, 100 plus programs, courses, classes happening. And actually, I brought this uh, graphic here. It's a very interesting graphic, graph because it's the graph of visualization of the article mitochondria. And I would like to thank my friend Thiago Lubiana, who gave a presentation about the COVID-19 and education and uh, Wikidata, that platform that I mentioned before. And he actually got this uh, graphic, which is very interesting because we can see that the waves on the graphic coincide with the academic semesters. And the first semester is greater than the second. And this, this year, the first wave was almost half as wide in the previous years. So you can see here, it's from 2015 uh, until 2020. So this is a kind of graphic that you can actually see how people, how students, how teenagers, young people access the internet. And they usually are actually looking for information, educational information uh, to study for tests, finals and everything in this year the search for that topic was lower than usual. The educational wiki activities, the formats that you can do online or offline are seminars where when you actually kind of teach how they can how students can use Wikipedia and other wiki platforms. Usual classes, it's also a format, discussion groups, uh, a content editathons that's like a very special kind of event because uh, people get around and uh, that's very good actually for like events that we can also open for people that are not from this specific institution but everyone can join and they we usually have like a class uh, explaining how to use Wikipedia and then people actually go there make a, an account on Wikipedia and start to edit. There's also photographic wall which are obviously offline, but it's also a kind of educational activity that we can make use. And um, those three uh, icons here are, the, well, this first one is the Wikipedia platform. This is the Wikimedia Commons, which is the multimedia kind of platform that uh, is, it has all the images and videos and audios available on the, on the Wikipedia. And this is the Wikidata one, which is very interesting uh, because it has a structured data that fits all the other platforms. So uh, Wikipedia is very interesting because develop, improve uh, competence and skills and abilities on writing and research. Uh, Commons is very interesting because it gives you a multimedia kind of uh, approach. And also Wikidata is, is interesting because it teaches how to access information, how that information can be reproduced in other places. And uh, Brazilian is interesting because actually we, have, we are like it's a very uh, complicated country, um, but we have some interesting cases. For example, the Casper Libre College, which is uh, the one that I started as a student in 2016, as a student on the, the page that I showed before, social science. And then I started to get, uh, I really liked that activity and got engaged to it. And uh, it became my work. Now I am the project manager here in the education 
kind of uh, person on Wikipedia right now. And uh, on the case of Casper Libre, we, ha we have 23 programs. They use all the platforms. They have formats and classes, activities, uh, editing marathons, ex uh, excursions. And the areas are communication, art, social science, adversity. Uh, they have partnerships with museums and other educational institutions. And they have improved information on campaigns, for example, Dead and Missing and the Military Dictatorship in Brazil, the History Heritage in Sao Paulo. So they like improve pages about people that died and the military dictatorship, the articles of those people on, on Wikipedia, and then enhance the, the pages for historic heritage uh, uh, in Sao Paulo, which is very interesting. And those are the numbers of this campaign, those campaigns together on this college. So, like, it's very impressive, the numbers, the words that it, the article views. Um, so, I, I'm tr I think I'm a little bit uh, late here, but, um, so, just so you can have an example, this is one of the most famous painting in Brazil by a, a painting about our independence and uh, it's a very important painting as I said everyone kind of knows it and if you go to the Wikipedia page uh, it's actually a page that was enhanced during one of those projects in Casper Libre so they made it really big very very, uh, very complete and then there is like the page for the painting with all the multimedia kind of versions that you have for it. And then the painting itself with all the information about the painting and then the Wikidata article for that painting, which has like all the information here. And as I said, if you kind of change the language here, everything also changes. And then we have this very interesting project, which is the Spoken Wikipedia, in which the students of uh, Casper Libro, they recorded uh, audio description uh, for people with uh, uh, visual impairment problems, and uh, so that they could uh, uh, quote, see the uh, painting in another way. They could actually, like, there's like, this person that I know that listened to this uh, painting, and start to cry because she couldn't see the painting, but now she, she was listening to the painting. So this is very interesting, as well as a very accessible kind of project. And this is for image and articles. There's also this other uh, campaign, this research center in the uh, in University of Sao Paulo. It has a lot of uh, uh, programs in different kind of areas. And uh, it's a very interesting case because not only they have their, their courses, but also they have contact with basic communication institutions, not only university, but also high school, which is very difficult for us. Uh, those are their numbers. They're very, very impressive as well. And uh, there is a very interesting kind of thing that they are doing. Uh, they've done, they have done it already, it's finished, but it's the Blum. Uh, Mathematica, which is kind of a partnership that they do with museums, uh, libraries, and everything. This is the case for Mathematica, which is a, a museum where they improve math information uh, available on the articles on Wikipedia, illustrating those pages with the content from the Mathematica, uh, interact with practical disciplines. So I just let here a kind of video that they made. Um, teaching how to actually do the mathematical math uh, available on that museum. And we have here the page for not mathematics as well. So I'm kind of trying to rush here to finish. We have some other important uh, universities with a lot of programs other universities with a lot of courses. And we have this 
kind of different kind of overview with, with uh, Reverse Food and Wikipedia. Uh, they are both uh, organization platform for educators. There's uh, Wikipedia, in, uh, we, we have the focus on content as well because it's an encyclopedic kind of platform. Uh, but on both of them, the content is available for students and they are also very connected to all the other platforms. So you can actually uh, go around and connect everything. It's kind of like this network of knowledge that is being uh, built here. And we also have those two other platforms, which I mentioned before, with data and dashboard. So with data, it's important because it structured information, help on wiki robots, robots that are like good robots because uh, they are only organizing the information available. Uh, it makes the reading more accessible. And there is also this Embavel, which is a tool, a Wikidata tool, that offer, offers an initial draft page on Wikipedia on certain topics. So that is good for students that are kind of initiating on Wikipedia and they don't know how to write it uh, very well. And there's also the dashboard, which is the place where the data is kind of counted. The students, uh, the professor can know which students edit, what they edit, when they edit. So here I'm finishing my presentation. Uh, before Wikipedia and this open knowledge kind of platform for students and educators, everything was kind of close to and held together by the institution itself. And then the educator, the students and the material were there by the institutions physically, by the institution locally. And then after, uh, in this process of uh, decolonization, basically, we have the institutions and the uh, educators and the students and everyone else, so others. And the most important thing is not uh, the institution anymore, but the knowledge itself. And obviously, the benefits of it are decentralizing the knowledge the access to information, the mass impact that this does because it's multilingual, it's crowdsourcing because not only the students can edit, but other users can edit that information and enhance that information. And there's also content with other institutions and in other countries and all over the world. It provides content to everyone. There is also some challenges. Uh, Gustavo will talk about, uh, about that uh, a lot. But I mean, it's very, it's uh, a thing that we have to keep in mind, which is the internet access, the low resources that people still have problems with. Uh, we also have to further improve the accessibility. I show some examples of that, but it's not uh, enough. We have to uh, make it better uh, video and streaming mechanisms right now for people that are dealing with it, uh, considering uh, the COVID-19 uh, aspect as well. We have to have more contact with basic education institutions, not only universities, but also high schools and uh, even younger ones. Um, and we ha also have some cultural, gender and ethnic diversity problem, which is like uh, with data is very white and rich kind of male kind of platform. And we also have to address the digital literacy problem that Gustavo mentioned before. So that's it. I'm sorry if I had to rush in the end because it was a very long presentation that I can. But here's my contact. If you guys want to uh, look me up later. Thank you very much, Giovanna, for the great presentation and all the insights that you brought about uh, the Wikipedia ecosystem in Brazil. Uh, I'm allowing for questions. Uh, we ran a little bit out of time, but uh, I'm so sorry. no, don't don't worry, don't worry. Uh, but we are still like open for questions. So in case you have anything to ask either to Gustavo or to Giovanna, just uh, raise your hand and and you have the floor. Or if you prefer to type in the chat, it's also fine. So Benjamin had asked me a question if. I have the time now, I could address it. Is that Absolutely. okay, Juliana? Yeah, 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 you have to go. So, Benjamin's question, uh, do you consider important to encourage content providers to 
to develop tools that, that facilitate resources to help linguistic diversity. What interference should governments have in this? So uh, that is a very interesting question and quite complex in reality. Uh, first, I think that uh, incentivizing, um, when it comes to software mainly, I've, and open source content, open source software and, and so on mainly, it is always, always good to allow for tools that facilitate translation. So on the ISOC module, one of, one of the things they say is uh, the difference between ASCII and Unicode. So uh, if more organizations, if more projects incorporate Unicode instead of ASCII, as they call, as they call it, uh, that facilitates translation. If software is designed with uh, interna internationalization in mind, that is good. That, again, that facilitates the development of multilingual content. Uh, that is always good. That is my opinion. Now, when we talk about government, that becomes a more complex issue because uh, then we start stumbling on the fact that uh, there, are, there are very different national contexts. So if you go to Canada, for example, it is a bilingual, bilingual country, so it's uh, so it's French and English. So for them, I think it is very important to incentivize the multilingualism. And yes, I think the government should take measures in that direction. Uh, Brazil, we speak Portuguese and Brazilian sign language. So uh, that people often forget the second one. So. The government here we have uh, is incentivizing that our universities that incentivize teaching uh, Brazilian sign language. There are projects, so yes, in a way we are also multilingual, and so on. It it goes, but uh, I think that yes, governments can choose. It can it is viable. It can be very healthy, but it needs to be adapted to the local reality, to the specific linguistic needs of a location. So, for example, if I live in the coast, uh, there, there are no Spanish speakers around here. But if you go to the border, it is a very different situation. So it may be, maybe not the national level, but the state, the state level, might have a lot of interest in teaching Spanish to, in schools and so on. So I think it is quite a complex situation. It is not a simple policy question. When it comes to software, Translation tools, excellent, amazing. But when it when we start getting into the nitty gritty of the process of translation, which is very expensive, and all the modifications you need to put, then it gets complicated, and then we need to think on a case by case basis. Okay, thank you so much. And I think it's very complex because in Latin America, countries are characterized by many citizens with uh, different languages and regional languages, so. It's, it's a complex issue, but thank you so much. Great, thank you very much for the question, Benjamin, and also Gustavo for the, for the reply. I see that uh, Joan has a question. Uh, Joan, go ahead, unmute yourself, and you have the floor. Hi, everybody. Oh, thank you for the present, the both presentations. That was very good. And Giovanna, uh, I got me wondering that uh, if Wikimedia organizes like partner one time partnerships like for for organize uh, only one time event and i would like to know if it's possible uh i'm not sure if i understood you you want to uh know if uh, Wikimedia is trying to do a one-time partnership. Uh, actually, uh, I'm asking if your organization do one-time partnerships, like oh. because you showed us that we have you have like uh, very strength partners, and yes. I would like to know if you do this kind of. Or yes, or yes, absolutely. No, you you were very clear. I was not, uh, I didn't understand actually. But yes, we do one time partnership as well. 
for example, we have, uh, as I mentioned on the slide, the, uh, the research centers for mathematics that uh, we have uh, this big partnership. And through them, we actually do some other smaller partnership because it's a, a research center at the University of Sao Paulo. And then, like, for example, someone from other departments kind of know us because we work there. And they're like, oh, I see that you do some uh, week uh, events. Could we do one here as well? So we just go over there and then we do kind of a partnership for a day. And uh, we do like an event, usually a kind of editathon, a content editathon. So we just like gather some students uh, that they are studying some specific subject. And then we enhance the answers, the articles on Wikipedia about that subject. Usually, the, the partnership there is like just one time kind of partnership are like that. But uh, we can we can have have other formats as well. Great, thank you very much, uh, João, for the question, and also Giovanna for answering it. Uh, I don't hear any other hands raised. Uh, does anyone uh, has? Any other question for, for Gustavo or Giovanna? Oh, I see Eduardo has her hand raised. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. I just have a little question and a uh, provoke for us. Uh, and that's about dis disabled persons. Are there resources for disabled people to access information and education? Thanks. Giovanna, do you want to go first? Yeah, I can, I can go first. So uh, what I can remember right now, it's the like the most kind of known example that we know it's a partnership that we have with this uh, NOG called Latamara, which is like this uh, place that they uh, kind of work on the content for people that can see. So actually we have this, because this is a big problem on Wikipedia because sometimes when we have, for example, uh, mathematic uh, formulas or images, those kind of contents are not available for people that can see, can read normally, no, I'm sorry, not normally, but usually uh, as we do. So we have to work on those tools to make them better for those people because uh, this is a problem on the entire internet. It's not, not only like on Wikipedia or, and even in schools, we don't have like a proper uh, educational system that allow people that have, uh, uh, that, they, that they can, can see, they can hear, they can hear how do you, have, how do you uh, provide education for people that have those uh, issues? So uh, what we can do on Wikipedia is trying to make the information that is already uh, in a right form more available, more accessible. So we have, have tools and uh, partnerships that try to make the text available on, on uh, audio, but not only like in this kind of structure, kind of robotic, uh, uh, sound, you know, for example, so we try to work with that, with some people that already work on that area to make it better, to make it more like accessible and more enjoyable as well. It's not only uh, just like, make it available, no, just you have to work on that and make it better. Uh, adding to what Giovanna said, uh, there are technological resources that can greatly facilitate inclusion. So I just posted here uh, two websites. They are projects that offer uh, translation from written language to sign language. So if you if you guys don't know, uh, it is very difficult. It is much more difficult for someone who is deaf to learn written language. Uh, I, I won't go into the details, but it is much more challenging. So many deaf people, they have a hard time uh, reading written language. So automatic translators to uh, sign language, that is a cool thing. Uh, lots of websites, they are, they are designed in a way that they are friendly to what we call screen readers. So that's a piece of software that can read 
read out loud what's in the text. That is very good for people with blindness. There are also software to zoom in. So if you have an iPad, if you have a, a, a smartphone, uh, there's probably some kind of function built in to zoom in, to make the font size bigger. So accessibility comes in many forms, in many shapes. Uh, so generally incentivizing technical solutions to accessibility for disabled people, that is a big plus. Uh, some of those are much more, uh, they're much more obscure. So I was, um, I, it isn't, it stopped right now, but I was doing a little bit of research about uh, people on the autis, autism spectrum. And there are also a few accessibility features, even for people, even they have, they can have their senses. Uh, they have sight, they have hearing, everything. But there are also a few interesting accessibility features for them. So it is, it can get very, very deep. Uh, people with the dyslexia, there are fonts that are more friendly to people with dyslexia, for example. Uh, like, it goes very, very deep. That said, there are technological trends which can, in one fell swoop, in just a single day, they can destroy all of this. Uh, you can have your software, that your screen reader, and then uh, Facebook or another very important website changes something and your screen reader doesn't work anymore on that website. Uh, I have, I have, I have friends who are deaf. So that's hearing. Uh, and one of, one of the things they faced was that I was talking with them about this is that the internet, uh, 15 years ago was much more friendly to people who are deaf because back then we, we didn't rely so much on video. So like, uh, think about tonight. Uh, everything we've been doing tonight, uh, we are talking, we are uh, streaming video that is very hard for someone who's deaf to follow, much harder than they would have, you know, just reading. So I have this, friend, this group of friends, we play video games on the weekend. And after we are done here, I'm going to play with them. Uh, and one of our friends is deaf. And he didn't want, he didn't often play with us because of that. Because we, we were, we would play on voice chat. So even those simple features can be exclusionary. And again, 15 years ago, streaming wasn't such a big thing. We didn't voice chat. Now we do. And in, because of a single technological advancement and YouTube as well, then deaf people saw themselves much more excluded. And this is a persistent thing. So it is a very difficult subject. Can I just add something uh, that I thought while we were we, we were talking? Um, uh, uh, Wikipedia, in other way, in the, like in a different way of the like the way that uh, the digital world is being built right now, there is being available. It's not a, a platform that depends that much on video and audio. Is more a text-based kind of platform. So we have the other way around the problem. We, we have like mathematical formulas that uh, uh, someone that can uh, see, they can't read that mathematical formula because it's not uh, available to machine reading, for example. When they are trying to, for example, trying to read uh, an article about um, a mathematical formula or a mathematical issue. So the problem is more the other way around because we don't have uh, like a community that is very close to video and audio. So we have the other way around. Kind of That's just what I wanted to say. Um, last year, Giovanna, in the Brazilian Internet Forum, there was one of the workshops about accessibility. And one of the lecturers, one of the speakers, was someone who his, his job was translating a device, um, government calls, into a machine readable document because they would often have tables tables of contents so like oh your salary if you're in this stage will be like this this and that so there was a whole thing about how to embed machine readable text into those images uh, i don't know if you're aware of that but no. i would assume in wiki in wikipedia you should check that but the, the problem with wikipedia would be just the sheer scale of content yeah. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs>
Yeah, because it's a lot of content. So how do you do everything? There is not a like as I said, the most interesting thing about Wikipedia is that anyone can edit. So the content is very big, but at the same time, if you have to make a kind of revision or a kind of change, it's more it's much more difficult. So, yes. Because you have, <laughs> you have a lot of information and you have to go through the community. And sometimes the community is a very interesting aspect, but excellent. sometimes there's also problems when you have to talk to everybody to decide something. So it's kind of tricky as well. You, you should, on the nick.br, the profile, um, check uh, the workshop. One of, one of them was about accessibility. It will be interesting. Can you uh, send I can get it for you. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry. Any, any more questions, I guess? Yeah, anybody else? Uh, please raise your hands. Uh, I don't see any hands raised, uh, but well, everybody has the contact information from both Giovanna and Gustavo. So if you do uh, end up having any other questions that you want to address with them personally, uh, please feel free to, to contact them uh, through the addresses that they have provided in their presentations. Uh, well, it was a pleasure to have you both here, Gustavo and Giovanna. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for the great information that you shared with us today. Uh, also for the rest of the participants, thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, this was the fourth webinar of our series. So next week we're going to have another one uh, with also with special guests. Uh, we're going to send you the, the link in time. Uh, so be prepared for that. Uh, I see there's something on the chat from Eduardo. Okay, just saying good night. Uh, well, good night, everybody. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you, Gustavo and Giovanna. And I'll see you all next week. Uh, before, uh, Giovanna, I'm going to check later. I think this is the lecture. But uh, I was there. I will check. I will check it later. You know, it's easier for me than for you to go through all of them to make sure. So Thank you yeah. Very much. And good night, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, bye bye. Good night. Good night.